My name is Marguerite Beckford. I'm the Commercial Horticulture Extension Agent in Sarasota County. So before we begin presentations, I always like to give an overview of what Extension is. Many of you might have seen me give this little spiel about what Extension is, but I never assume that everybody knows what Extension is because we always hear, oh, you guys are the best kept secret and we don't wanna be a secret. <laughs> so let me just give you an overview in case you don't know what Extension is. It's a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida and the US Department of Ag. It uses university research and resources to address local needs through community initiatives, classes, outreach and volunteer opportunities. It provides practical education to help residents, professionals, and other decision makers to build a better future. So that's our mission. And because we get monies from the USDA, um, Sarasota County, and University of Florida, the state of Florida, I just want to pre present this map to you to show you that extension in Florida is actually part of a nationwide network of land-grant universities that have been given the task of providing extension for whatever state they're in. So if you lived in Texas, Texas A&M is your land-grant university that's responsible for extension. So University of Florida is a land-grant university for Florida and so we are responsible for extension in Florida. So a summary of the programs we offer in Sarasota County, there is an extension office in every single county in Florida. So there are 67 extension offices. <clears throat> and in Sarasota County, we offer classes on landscaping, Florida friendly landscaping. We offer master gardener programs. Some of you joining us are master gardeners. We offer the master naturalist program that educates Floridians about how to take care of the wonderful natural resources we have in Florida. There are um, aquatic education programs. So your Florida water stewardship program, lake watch program, sea grant program, and microplastic awareness project all provide education on how we can better take care of our water resources, whether it's fresh water or marine resources. Then we have educational programs on just more being more sustainable using say solar energy, driving electric cars, so that we can actually preserve the quality of life that we have in Sarasota County by using more sustainable um, approaches to resource use. We also do 4-H youth education and last but not least, we do nutrition and health education through our family and consumer sciences program. So that's who we are in a nutshell. So let's look at what we're gonna be covering today under lawn care solutions. When you're looking at figure, troubleshooting lawn care problems, you wanna look for what your goals are. Your goal really is to have healthy turf. And we're gonna go through how you get healthy turf. Um, your goal also is to address the most common turf management problems. So we're gonna have a look at bugs, fungi, etc. cetera. Um, what are the most common pest problems in turf? And we're gonna look at what are the most common disease problems in turf as well. And um, many of those problems can actually be solved by just the way you actually take care of your lawn. So we're gonna go through ways in which we can become part of the solution to lawn care problems versus part of the problem. Okay, all right. So before we begin, we always like to just engage you in just a little baseline knowledge quiz. We never like to assume that you know a lot or you know a little, we always teach in the middle of the class. And so in the chat box, just type in the answers to these questions. If you don't know, it's fine to say, I don't know, because you'll get the answers as we go along. So just type in the answers to these questions. Question one, 
And you can do 1A or 2A or 3A, whatever, just so that we have a knowledge baseline of you know, how much or how little you know about this subject. So the first question is, the correct mowing height for St. Augustine grass is two inches. Is that yes, no, or you have no idea? The second question is, so type that in the answer into your chat box. Second answer is quick release fertilizers have more advantages than slow release. Say yes, no, you, you don't know. And question three, most lawn irrigation systems should be run twice weekly. Say yes, no, I don't know. So I'm not gonna give you the answers just yet, but keep typing in. If you haven't put your answer in yet, just type it in the chat and um, I'll hold you in suspense for a little longer while we get the answers. All right, so we'll cover the answers as we go through. So turf grass is actually um, part uh, of the Poaceae family. It's in that large family of grasses that corn and other um, monocots belong to, like your bamboo. And those are the graminae. But the gr turf grass itself is part of the Poaceae family. The growing point of your turf grass is going to be at the crown, which is really, really close to the soil line. And so Grass does not grow from the tip of the grass blade. It grows from the base of the grass blade that's just next to the soil line. We'll look at identifying grasses by the tillers. So tillers are just the spikes that they put up with the grass flowers and grass seeds. We call it a seed head. Um, turf grass also has rhizomes, which are underground roots that run and stolons, which are above ground runners. So <clears throat> what's interesting about turf grass is that even though it's related to other grasses like your elephant grass or your fountain grass, turf grass varieties are specially adapted to tolerate regular pruning. Your other grasses, if you cut your fountain grass every week, it would kill it. <laughs> so other grasses are not adapted to being regularly pruned or cut back the way turf grass is. There are cool, warm, and transitional turf grass types. We will be focusing mostly on the warm season turf grasses. And then we'll do a little bit of, you know, definition of the difference between reseeding and overseeding as we go through. Okay. So turf can be established by seed, sod, sprigs, and plugs, depending on the varieties. St. Augustine cannot be established by seed. You have to use sod, sprigs, and plugs. But Bermuda, Zoysia, and Bahia can be established using all of these methods. Thatch, we will go through that in a few slides, but that's just a buildup of um, old leaf tissue, and you wanna avoid thatch buildup as much as you possibly can. We'll go through um, your fertilizer analysis, the three numbers on your fertilizer label, what they mean and why they are important. And in addition to that, the fertilizer ratio, the ratio of each element to re in relation to the other one, that's also important as well. We'll cover slow release nitrogen, why that is important, and then look at a few sources of nitrogen in your fertilizer, which would include nitrate, ammoniacal, ammonia, and urea. So sometimes turf gets a bad rap um, because people will say that, you know, turf is um, this turf can have some detrimental environmental impacts, but it's not really the turf that has the detrimental environmental impacts. It's how the turf is managed that creates those, those detrimental impacts. Um, if you think about every square inch 
of space that's covered by turf. If it was not covered by turf, but it was covered by concrete or asphalt, how much hotter your um, surroundings would be. And so turf does provide um, some utility benefits. So the roots stabilize soil and prevent erosion. The, the, the turf has a cooling effect on the environment. If you were to swap out turf for hardscape or asphalt, your environment would be a lot hotter. And turf acts as a filter to absorb stormwater runoff and other um, pollutants. And then you have the aesthetic value of turf where, you know, just a nice, well-kept turf area is pleasing and it's relaxing. It makes you want to go hang out and just um, get some recreation, some recreational activity um, engagement. All right. Um, the third function of turf grass is for sport utility. And so um, <clears throat> nobody would consider, you know, football touchdowns or even tackles on concrete <laughs> or asphalt. And so, you know, when turf is used for um, sports facilities, it actually does reduce its injury and it actually enhances the functionality of the space for um, sports facilities. So turf is not all bad, but let's figure out how to manage it the best way possible so that we're putting in not so many fertilizers or so many pesticides or so many fungicides, but we're managing it in, an, in a sustainable way. All right, so <clears throat> now that we've looked at the uses of turf, let's look at why turf is so useful. Um, there are many varieties of turf that will differ based on these factors here. Um, wear resistance, there's some turf varieties that are more resistant to, more resistant to traffic. And so they recover better um, when you have traffic um, you know, say a football game or a soccer game, there are some varieties of turf that do better at recovery. And so your rigidity, your elasticity, your resilience, and the ability for the turf to recuperate from pest and disease pressures are all functions you wanna look for when you're choosing a turf to um, establish, okay? So, like I said, sometimes turf gets a bad name, but the four points here are usually the reason why turf gets a bad name. You do have to water your turf more than you water almost any other landscape plant. You know, shrubs, hedges, palms don't require nearly half as much the water that turf does. Um, typically, with the exception of maybe your palms, turf also will require more fertilizer than your other landscape plants. And it may require more um, chemical interventions because of pest pressures. And um, so these are the reasons. And then obviously, you know, you if you prune your palm once a year, you certainly don't mow your grass once a year. So it does require more frequent maintenance. And so that's one of the reasons turf gets a bad name. But as I said before, it is the management of the turf to make sure that it, you're managing it more sustainably for you to get the most benefits out of the turf, okay? So you wanna make sure that wherever you have turf, you actually have turf there because you need turf there. If you don't need turf there, then you can always replace the turf with something else, a ground cover, et cetera. And your ground cover plants like your Asiatic jasmine or your perennial peanut will require almost no maintenance. It will definitely require no fertilizer, very few chemicals, and it will be able to survive on um, rainfall and not need extra irrigation. And so this is just one option to weigh whether, you know, do I need, need 1,000 square feet of turf, or can I get by with 500 square feet of turf or 300 square feet of turf? Can I reduce my 
turf square footage. So I reduce um, the time and money I spend on maintaining turf. All right. So turf grass BMPs, as BMPs just mean best management practices. And that's what I meant when I said managing your turf sustainably, doing the best practices management for your turf can actually make your life a lot easier when it comes to um, lawn care. So as I said before, your goal really is healthy turf. That's what you want. You want healthy turf because your healthy turf will slow stormwater runoff. It will filter contaminants in, in your runoff, in your stormwater. It reduces leaching, which is a downward movement of water through soil. It reduces soil erosion and it protects your groundwater by making sure that any water that filters into the aquifer is cleaner as a result of going through, say, a six inch root zone of turf roots. Okay, so here's an overview of our most popular Florida turf grasses. Okay, we're gonna look at characteristics, pros and cons of each. So your Bahia, your St. Augustine, your Zoysia, your Centipede and your Bermuda grass. Now, I'm telling you, you would be hard pressed to find somebody who does not appreciate the aesthetic, the aesthetic value of a well-kept lawn. Um, but the goal of this presentation is to help you maintain a, a good lawn um, that's healthy and to identify some of the things you can actually do to improve the health of your lawn. Okay, so from left to right, just close-ups of what these lawn grasses look like. That's your zoysia. Let me zoom in a little bit. Not too much. Sorry. Not trying to give you motion sickness there. <laughs> and if you've never taken a class with me before, I'm just going to say right now, I give corny jokes. So if you're allergic to corny jokes, I would suggest you um, take some Benadryl right now. See? Another corny joke. All right. All right. Back to lawns. Okay. So that's a close-up of your zoysia, seashore paspalum, Bermuda, St. Augustine, and your Bahia. So your paspalum, I'm sorry, your Bahia grass, I said paspalum because that's a, that's a genus name. Whoops, I'm sorry, my mouse is doing really strange things. <laughs> okay, so we're back on track, yes. Paspalum is the genus name for Bahia. You'll see that there are other um, grasses in the Paspalum genus, like your seashore Paspalum. But um, your Bahia grasses are one of the most low maintenance turf grasses you can have. Um, your Pensacola variety is going to be more cold tolerant than say your Argentine variety. Um, and then the Argentine variety produces a lot of seed heads. And so really you just want to weigh the pros and cons of um, the grasses you're using and the varieties. I personally like Bahia grass because like I said, it's one of those set it and forget it turf grasses. You know, I always joke and say, if Bahia grass is good enough for DOT, it's good enough for me. They use, the, the Department of Transportation uses Bahia grass in the medians everywhere and they don't irrigate it, they don't fertilize it and the Bahia grass takes a licking and keeps on ticking. So I like Bahia grass. Um, there are pros and cons to Bahia just like um, every other grass. So like I said, it's good drought. It's very, it has very good drought tolerance. It takes a licking, keeps on ticking. Um, set it and forget it kind of grass. You don't need um, extra irrigation. It might brown out during the dry season, but it will rebound, re, it will bounce back, I should say. Um, the minute you start watering it or the minute the rain falls, it, it greens up nicely. It has 
low maintenance and fer or fertility requirements. You don't have to fertilize it, it would be fine. Um, it is very tolerant of sandy, infertile soils. And so um, it does well pretty much anywhere you put it. And the, it, it can be established easily from seed or sod. So those are your advantages of your bahia grass. Some of your disadvantages of your bahia grass include the fact that it has an open growth, growth habit. I will um, explain what that means in a bit. It can be susceptible to mole cricket. Um, and so you'll see ball patches here from mole crickets. And sometimes people will say that it is more difficult to mow than your um, St. Augustine because when you mow by hair, it looks almost like you didn't mow it two days later. You know, the, the stems are coarse and so they don't lay down like a perfect carpet the way um, your St. Augustine does. So what I mean by open growth habit is the blades do not grow densely together. So if you're looking at this picture here, you could actually see through the blades down to the soil. And so that's what we mean by an open growth habit. It's not densely compacted concentration of blades. And so because of that, weeds can grow up and through the blades. Um, other disadvantages include poor wear tolerance, so it, it doesn't tolerate a lot of traffic. You'll actually see traffic marks um, wherever, you know, you've driven on your Bahia. It doesn't bounce back from traffic very well. And it produces a lot of um, seed heads in summer. And this is what the Bahia seed head looks like. This is how you know you have Bahia grass if your seed heads look like that. Okay, so St. Aug Augustine grass is also a very popular um, turf type. Um, this grass, um, as you see here, the close up wide leaf blades. And so you'll get this really dense, compact growth habit that looks like a carpet. And so people like the look of the St. Augustine grass, but like every other turf type, there are pros and cons to St. Augustine. So some of your examples, some of your varieties of St. Augustine include your Floratam, which is the most common type you'll see. Almost every yard that has St. Augustine will have Floratam variety. You have your Bitter Blue, your Palmetto. Then you have some Dwarf varieties down here which means that the blades don't grow as long or as wide. And so they kind of, um, your lawn looks more compact and more dense than say your traditional Floratam lawn. So the advantages of St. Augustine is that it has good shade tolerance. It has good to salt tolerance. You can use it near the coast and you won't have your grass freaking out. It is very tolerant to a wide pH soil range. It will establish quickly from sod and it grows vigorously. Disadvantages include the fact that because they don't have underground rhizomes, they don't, they don't run underground, all the, all the growing points are above. So you'll see runners above ground. It is not very drought tolerant. So Whenever there's a dry spell, your St. Augustine will die. It won't bounce back. <laughs> so if you have St. Augustine, you do have to irrigate it if there's a dry spell. St. Augustine also has poor wear tolerance. It is susceptible to excessive thatch formation. I'll explain what that means in a bit. And it is also susceptible to chinch bug pest pressures. And so this is what your chinch bug um, damage looks like. Interestingly enough, remember I said that you wanna be a part of the solution and not the problem. Too much fertilizer actually encourages um, an expansion of the chinch bug population. 
And so you might think you're doing your lawn a good thing by giving it a lot of fertilizer, but you're also causing any chinch bug population that you have to increase as a result of increased fertilizer. Um, one very important disadvantage of your St. Augustine is that it is very sensitive to a lot of the herbicides you would use to try to control grass weeds. So for example, if you were trying to control crabgrass or goosegrass in your St. Augustine, you would be hard pressed to find an herbicide that's a grass killer that won't also kill your St. Augustine. Um, this is not the case for Bahia, Bermuda, Zoysia. You, you are able to find grass weed killers that won't um, kill Zoysia, Bermuda, and Bahia. Other disadvantages include um, disease pressures. So St. Augustine is very susceptible to a lot of the fungal lawn diseases like take all root rot, um, like St. Augustine gray leaf spot, you know, um, and so you will have issues, especially if you water your lawn um, more than it requires, you know, so again, being a part of the solution and not a problem, not a part of the problem, making sure that you're not giving your water, your lawn more water than it requires will actually save you from having to address a lawn that has fungal problems or disease problems. St. Augustine is a warm season grass and so it's not going to be tolerant to um, cold weather and you cannot grow it from seed, it can only be established from from sprigs, sod, or, or plugs. <laughs> Tripping over my tongue here. Okay. Here's your zoysia. Again, one of those densely growing grasses that when it's healthy, looks like a carpet. Um, lots and lots of people like zoysia. I like zoysia if it's in somebody else's yard. And that's another one of my corny jokes. Um, the reason I say I like so as if it's in somebody else's yard is because it's beautiful. It's a beautiful lawn. Um, the texture of it is feels like carpet too. So if you were to walk barefoot on a Zoysia lawn, it just feels awesome. You know, really, really awesome on your feet. But Zoysia is the high maintenance girlfriend of turf grasses. Um, I tell everybody that because you have to um, find the sweet spot of not too much water, not too much fertilizer, not mowing it too low in order for a zoysia lawn to be happy. And so that's why I call it the high maintenance girlfriend of the turf family. Um, but I love zoysia, like I said, if it's in somebody else's yard. Okay, so, Let's go down the disadvantages of, I'm, I'm sorry, let's go down the advantages of zoysia. Like I said, dense growth habit, beautiful, beautiful lawn. Um, you have a really low mowing height. It has moderate shade tolerance. So you might be able to get away with it growing at the edge of a tree canopy, not right up next to the tree trunk, but maybe towards the edge of the canopy where there's a little bit of shade. Um, and it has lower nitrogen requirements than St. Augustine. So those are your advantages. Zoysia has very good wear tolerance and that's why they use it on a lot of sports fields. Um, so, you know, it, it literally can take a, 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 a kicking. <laughs> and keep on ticking. Um, and then most grass herbicides that you would use to kill like crabgrass and goose grass, they are safe for you to use on zoysia. So that, those are some advantages of zoysia. Disadvantages of zoysia are, like I said, it's a high maintenance girlfriend. Um, the minute it's getting too much water, you're gonna get a bunch of fungal issues. You have brown patch, you have large patch, you name it, if a grass can get it, zoysia will get it, you know? So you're gonna have a lot of disease issues. And the thing about disease issues in zoysia 
is that one day, as in today, your lawn looks awesome, perfectly fine. And literally the next morning, your lawn looks like it's dying. Like somebody took a blowtorch and torched your lawn. It, it, it can be that um, dramatic when zoysia starts to go downhill. Because of the dense formation, zoysia can also have the tendency to develop thatch formation. You can get um, billbug pest, pest, pest pressures. We don't have a lot of hunting billbug in our area, but there is also a new, relatively new pest of zoysia called the tuttle mealybug, T-U-T-T-L-E, tuttle, like tuttle road. Um, tuttle mealybug um, is one of the pests that people are realizing is, is increasing in incidence um, in zoysia. And zoysia has a relatively high water requirement, but, 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 <laughs> if you exceed that water requirement, then you're gonna have um, fungal issues, okay? So your another disadvantage is that once the temperatures drop because it's a warm season grass, once the temperatures drop, I would say below 70 degrees, zoysia starts to go dormant. It's like, okay, I'm going to hibernate. And it actually goes brown. You know, um, nitrogen fertilizer won't help it. <laughs> it's just the temperature. It's like, okay, time to go to sleep. And it will turn brown. It would be the first turf to turn brown once your temperatures drop below 70. And it will be the last turf to green up once our temperatures warm up and in, in spring. Um, and then if there is an extended dry spell, if you don't have automatic irrigation and there's an intent, in, um, extended dry spell, your zoysia will brown out quickly, but it does um, bounce back once you water it, okay? Your centipede grass, we don't grow a lot of centipede grass in South Florida because it's one of the very cold tolerant grasses. So you'll find this, say in north of Ocala, Gainesville area and up towards the Panhandle, um, they'll grow a lot of centipede grass. One thing about centipede grass is that it's not as green as say your other turf grasses like your St. Augustine or your zoysia. And so that's one disadvantage it has um, compared to the other grasses. Some common varieties of your centipede grass include your hammock, your covington, the common centipede grass, and your santi centipede grass. The hammock was actually developed to be more heat tolerant than the common one, than the common variety, and also to have a darker, less lime green color color than the common variety. So advantages of your centipede grass, it's very slow growing and it grows flat. It doesn't grow upright like your St. Augustine grass. So you can actually get away with mowing it less often than your other grasses. It has low fertility requirements. So you don't ever have to fertilize it unless you know, something really strange, strange is going on. It has few pests. It is cold tolerant. It can be grown from seeds, sprigs, sod, or plugs. It has fair shade tolerance and fair drought tolerance. It's not as drought tolerant as say your Bahia. And it grows well in acidic soils. Your disadvantage, is that because it grows slowly, trying to establish it in, via sod or even seed, you know, you'd, you'll, you'll need a little more patience with this. Um, it can be susceptible to ground pearls and spittle bugs. We don't have a lot of ground pearls in South Florida, but they're definitely an issue in North Florida. It can be subjected to iron deficiency on high so on high pH soils because it prefers acidic soils, and it has poor 
wear tolerance, so you can't really play, you know, soccer on centipede grass for a period of time and the grass won't notice. And then it has a tendency for attach formation as, um, as well. So your Bermuda grass. This grass is very, very popular for sports fields. So like on your golf greens, usually it's Bermuda grass that's used. Your football fields, soccer fields, etc. Bermuda grass is going to be most commonly used grass there. So your cultivars include your Arizona Common, your Barbados, your Casino Royal, you have dwarf varieties. The dwarf varieties are used on putting greens because, you know, putting greens have to be kept really, really short. And so they'll use the dwarf varieties on the putting green. Um, your quick stand, tipton, and Tiff Grand are also varieties that were developed for um, sports turf and golf courses. So for Bermuda grass, your advantages include the fact that Bermuda grass grows vigorously. The common Bermuda grass, what we call wild Bermuda grass grows so vigorously that it takes over your entire landscape sometimes. It will take over your shrubs. <laughs> um, so that's one advantage. It could also be a disadvantage of your herb uh, if you, depending on where you're trying to grow it. Um, other advantages include it is fine textured. It is adapted to a wide range of soils and climates. It is wear tolerant, as I mentioned, they use it a lot in sports fields. It is drought tolerant, it is salt, it is salt tolerant, and it is rapidly established. Disadvantages are that it can be high maintenance because it grows so vigorously, it can be high maintenance. Um, it can have a lot of pest issues. So some of the um, tolerances to pests that other grasses have, um, Bermuda grass can be susceptible to those pests. As I mentioned, because it grows vigorously, it has a tendency to invade your ornamental um, plant beds. Um, it can develop thatch and it has poor shade tolerance. So this is just a table comparing them. Um, and it's like an at a glance, what you need to know if you were choosing quote unquote, the perfect um, grass. Like I said, me personally, cause I don't have an automatic irrigation system. I like um, a rain fed landscape. So I have Bahia, no issues. Um, you know, it bounces back as soon as the rain comes. And if, if it needs a little, you know, help, I just put my oscillating sprinkler around and um, put my oscillating sprinkler on and we're good to go. So, um, Let me just, yeah, so let's move on to the other slide. Okay, so at a glance here, and, and um, if you need a copy of the presentation, just make sure your chat is selected to me only and send me your email address and I'll send you a copy of the slide presentations. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say, let's try to figure out how we can be a part of the solution versus being a part of the problem, okay? This is a chart from our turf researchers. I always tease the turf, turf researchers and tell them 
that they watch grass grow for a living <laughs> and it's true <laughs> but we're we're grateful that they watch grass grow for a living we do we do because it is because they watch grass grow for a living why they are able to come up with information like the one in this chart so you'll see that your bermuda grass has a wide range of ph is um on under which it will do well your your saint augustine won't do very well if your ph is say five and a half okay it likes it anywhere above five and a half to eight same with your zoysia same with your ryegrass your bahia grass however likes acidic soil so if your bahia is struggling you might want to drop the ph below seven um same with your um, carpet grass a lot of people don't deliberately grow car carpet grass but this chart just show well i mean in this part of florida i should say um in other parts they do deliberately grow car carpet grass and centipede grass but this is just um you know a snapshot of what ph levels your grasses will grow well at or grow best at i should say all right so just making sure that you're part of the solution and not part of the problem by trying to get grass to grow in pH as too high or too low. So smiley face, a lawn maintenance. Not a lot of people have a smiley face when they think about lawn maintenance because um, sometimes they think it's, you know, a lot of headaches. But if you know um, what to aim for in getting your turf healthy, you can have a smiley face when you consider lawn maintenance. Okay, so let's first look at mowing. How can you figure out mowing solutions to make sure that your lawn problems are minimal? Well, remember I said your goal is healthy turf. Um, and the picture on the left is what healthy turf looks like, okay? You have a lot of green material, <laughs> you have a lot of soil within which the roots can grow and support the healthy green material. The picture on the right is not healthy turf. You have very little green material, which means that this turf was just mowed within an inch of its life, literally. So you mowed it too low then in addition to that, because there was a lot of fertilizer being applied too frequently or in too great a quantity, what has happened is fertilizer has encouraged an overgrowth of leaf blades. And because the leaf blades have overgrown, there is a buildup of old tissue below the new growth. So that's really what thatch is. Thatch is just um, a layer of old leaf tissue and stem tissue that um, is in the process of being decomposed. However, and, and, and it's totally normal and natural, but if you do things to cause an overgrowth or rapid growth of leaf blades, you will have leaf blades building up, leaf blades getting old and building up and not being able to decompose quickly. And so you have more growth at a faster rate than the old growth can decompose. And then you'll have a buildup of old growth. And what this does is it prevents water from getting through to the roots where the soil is. It prevents nutrients from getting through to the roots where the soil is because the turf roots are here, but between the roots and the leaf blades are the old growth trying to decompose. And so this is the reason you don't want to fertilize too much. You don't want to water too much because you don't want to encourage rapid growth 
at a rate faster than the old growth can decompose. Otherwise, you're going to have fat buildup. And no amount of water that you're putting here is going to um, be able to penetrate sufficiently for the roots to be healthy. If you remember, I said that Zoysia, St. Augustine, and Bermuda are susceptible to thatch. This is what I was talking about because they, they have a dense growth habit. Um, you can get the buildup of thatch between the layer of the leaves and the soil. All right, so back to my favorite turf re researchers that I like to pick on. <laughs> These pictures, again, came from the turf researchers. They actually did a research that shows the taller your grass is. So the, the taller you mow your grass, the, the, the greater, the, if you mow your grass at the greatest height possible. So your mower deck is set to the highest level possible you will have the greatest depth of roots. Greatest depth of roots is very beneficial to you because if there's ever um, a fungus that attacks roots or a pest that attacks roots, obviously, if your lawn looks like this, you will have a better chance as of surviving any kind of pest or disease issues than if your lawn looks like this. Okay, you see my pointer here. This picture actually shows that the above ground growth of green tissue is a mirror image of the below ground growth of roots. So the more green tissue you have growing is the more the plants are able to photosynthesize and produce more roots. The less green tissue you have growing is the less the, the tissue is able to photosynthesize. You'll have less photosynthesis going on and so you'll have less roots growing, okay? So you want to be a part of the solution and mow your lawn at the highest possible level. Um, if you don't mow your own lawn, you know, after your lawn is mowed, go get a, a ruler and measure how tall the grass is. Um, in a few more slides, we're going to show you what the turf researchers recommend are the ideal heights for mowing different turf grasses. And when I say ideal height, I mean this is a height at which you should mow your grass if you want your grass to be healthy. Okay, so the turf researchers who watch grass grow for a living recommend that you mow your grass at the highest possible height for the species. When you mow, do not remove more than one third of the leaf blade and you should let the clippings fall back into the grass and not leave the clippings on a hard surface on, or an impervious surface. If there are clippings on an impervious surface, you wanna blow it back into um, where the lawn is because clippings on impervious surfaces eventually end up in the water bodies from runoff. And these clippings are full of nutrients. They're full of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And the nutrients, when they get into the water, will increase the growth of algae because algae feed off nutrients. So if you can keep nutrients out of the water, that would be a good thing, okay? So the, re the, the turf researchers showed that the root shoot ratio, the ratio of roots to shoots um, depends on how high or how low you mow your turf, okay? So I did mention that they came up with, you know, information on what is the best mowing height for each cultivar. Your St. Augustine should be mowed above three inches. So the next time your grass is mowed or you mow your grass, 
make sure you're mowing it above three inches, not below, um, for your standard cultivars. Your dwarf cultivars, because they do not grow, the blade does not grow as long as your standard cultivar, like your Floratam. Your dwarf cultivars can be mowed between two and two and a half inches. For your Bahia grass, you want to mow it at three inches, three to four inches. Your centipede grass, you want to mow it to one and a half, two and a half inches. Your zoysia grass, you can mow it lower than two inches. Um, and your Bermuda grass, you can mow it lower than an inch. Your, your zoysia and your Bermuda grass, that's why I said they, um, they use them a lot on sports fields because they will tolerate mowing really, really low. Nobody wants to play soccer in grass that's four inches tall. <laughs> and so your zoysia and your Bermuda grass can tolerate really close mowing or low mowing. And that's another reason they're used on sports fields. So this is just a comparison of the turf types and how high you should mow it if you want to become a part of your lawn care solution and not a part of the lawn care problem, okay? So here's your comparison. St. Augustine, Zoysia, Centipede, Bermuda grass, and like I said, um, switch your chat over to just me and um, send me your email address. I'll send you a copy of this presentation. Okay. So again, our goal is healthy turf. This is straight from the turf researchers. They did research on what happens when you mow the grass lower than it should be, okay? So this is a diagram of, or I should say a depiction of root responses to defoliation. When they remove 50% of the leaf blade, none of the roots stop growing. When they removed 70% of the leaf blade, 50% of the roots stop growing for 17 days. So for half a month, your, your roots are not growing because you removed almost three quarter of the leaf blade. And then when you, remove 90% of the leaf blade, what we call scalping, all of your roots will stop growing for 17 days. So just this right here shows you how to become part of the lawn care solution and avoid being part of the lawn care problem. Okay, so this is what I mean by scalping, you know, where you've removed almost all of the leaf blade, it will injure your turf because remember at the beginning I said, the growing point of your grass is the crown. It's below this green thing here. That's where the growing point is. The growing point is at the soil line. And so when you scalp it, you've injured the growing point. So it takes a really long time for that growing point to come back. You also have caused your roots to stop growing in that particular area. So once your roots start stop growing, your turf gets weaker and it becomes more susceptible to weeds and to other pest pressures, okay? So again, close up of the kinds of stress that scalping does to lawns. Um, I mentioned the growing point of the grass is the crown right here, just next to the soil line. You have a buildup of thatch which as I said, thatch is normal, but you don't want it building up to the extent where they're, they're, the layer of thatch is thicker than the root zone, okay? And so um, you're scalping, when you scalp your lawn, you create um, stress and make it more susceptible 
to pests and disease pressures and weed invasion. Okay, so when you're mowing, these are mowing best management practices or BMPs. Want to make sure your mower blades are sharp. You don't want to mow when the grass is wet because that causes it to lie down in one direction and you can actually scalp the grass because it's slippery and um, the mower kind of takes off more than it should. You want to remove your clippings and your weed seeds from the mower when you're done. You want to use personal protective safety equipment, um, which would include goggles if you know there might be debris in the lawn that gets kicked up by your mower. And make sure there is no debris before you start mowing. Okay, so when we say sharpen your mower, this is why. Every time you mow, you are actually causing a wound to the leaf blade. It's not gonna say, ouch, there's my corny joke, but it's a wound nevertheless. So everyone knows that a wound with a clean cut will heal much faster than a wound with a jagged cut. And this is why you wanna sharpen your blades because when you mow the lawn, you wanna cut down on the time the lawn spends sealing up that wound because the longer it spends trying to seal the wound is the more time it remains exposed to say a fungus or any kind of other issues. Okay. Now I said you don't want to leave your grass clippings on a hard surface. Don't leave them on the driveway. Don't leave them on the sidewalk. Don't leave them on the street side because rain runoff, stormwater runoff will carry the clippings into the water and the clippings are full of nutrients. Typically your grass clippings are gonna have nutrients in this ratio. They're go it's gonna have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium in this ratio. And so that's why you wanna put the nutrients back into the lawn. And you also wanna make sure that your mower deck, the, the height of your mower deck is as high as you possibly can make it so that you make your lawn more drought tolerant because it will have deeper roots and more um, pest and disease tolerant because it will have deeper roots. Okay, now let's talk about shade. Again, we're looking for healthy turf. Healthy turf needs full sun, okay? If turf is not growing in full sun, it won't be healthy, it will be growing but it won't be growing as vigorously as if it had full sun, okay? Um, and so that is a struggle a lot of people have with trying to grow grass, say near an oak tree or under an oak tree. Um, turf grass needs full sun. Now, with that being said, there are some varieties that can tolerate a little bit of shade more than others. And so in the order of most shade tolerance to least shade tolerance. This is the depiction. Your St. Augustine is most shade tolerant. It does not mean it will grow in dense shade, but it is more shade tolerant than your zoysia, than your centipede, than your bahia, than your Bermuda grass. And Bermuda grass is the least shade tolerant grass there is. So if you have a shady yard, Bermuda grass is not for you. Okay, within the St. Augustine um, variety, there are some cultivars that are that exhibit greater shade tolerance than others. So your Seville, your Del Mar, your Captiva are the most shade tolerant varieties of St. Augustine. Floratam is the least shade tolerant. And so remember I said most of the varieties you see in, in many of the landscapes is gonna be Floratam. And so if you have St. Augustine that is refusing to grow next to the, the, the canopy shade of an oak tree, you're, you probably have Floratam and you're gonna to need to get a different variety if you want it to grow well in shade. Okay, so again, being a part of the solution for healthy turf, 
If you have turf growing in the shade, you can do a number of things to make the turf healthy. You can prune the trees so that there's more light growing in, going through to the lawn. We don't recommend this, even though it's, a, it's an option, we don't recommend it. Because if you've ever pruned a plant, a woody plant, you know that after you prune it, it grows back with a vengeance. <laughs> so wherever you prune it, it wants to grow two and three and four or more um, branches from the point that you pruned it. So we don't recommend you trying to get the grass to grow by reducing the shade above the grass. Um, you definitely want to make sure that you reduce the amount of traffic that any turf that's growing in a shady area is subjected to. Because remember, turf grows most vigorously in full sun. So the picture you see here, the turf is growing, but it is not growing very vigorously, which means any kind of traffic, you have trapes in all over this grass that is not growing vigorously. The grass is not going to be happy. It's not gonna be able to recover very well. Turf growing in the shade, you want to reduce the amount of irrigation it gets because it means that since it's not growing in full sun, the level of transpiration and evaporation loss from water is going to be lower in the shade, so it's not going to need as much irrigation. Definitely want to reduce the amount of fertilizer it gets as well because, as I said, Turf in the shade is not growing as vigorously as turf in the sun would be. And so giving it fertilizer is just trying, is just encouraging it to grow at a rapid rate or a more rapid rate um, when it doesn't have enough sunlight to support that rapid rate of growth. And then for turf that's growing in the shade, you want to increase your mowing height and um, reduce your mowing frequency so that you can allow the grass to maximize photosynthesis because remember it's not getting the maximum amount of light that it requires to be vigorous. So another chart from our turf researchers just summarizing the shade tolerance of turf. Like I said, Bermuda grass not shade tolerant at all. Please don't Put your Bermuda grass anywhere near a shady tree. It will let you know it is not very happy. But here grass will tolerate some partial shade, a little bit of shade. Um, your zoysia also a little bit of shade on the edge of the canopy. And then your St. Augustine will actually survive in the center of the shady canopy area. So now Let's see if you got the answer to this question. So in the chat box now, type in the answer to this question. The correct mowing height for St. Augustine grass is two inches. And then while you're typing that in, I'm gonna look at the questions. So type in the chat box, answer to the question. The correct mowing height for St. Augustine is two inches. So I'm seeing a lot of no's and I am happy about that. Yes, the answer is no. Yes, the answer is no. That sounds very contradictory. Corny joke there. Um, yes, the answer is no. All right. So while you're continuing to type, I'm going through the chat box just to see if you have any questions. Okay, good. And yes, again, the answer is no, <laughs> okay? You don't want to be mowing your um, St. Augustine grass at two inches unless you have like a dwarf variety, okay? So the answer is no. Okay, so let's have a look at fertilizing your turf. Again, we're looking at making sure your turf is healthy. We're looking at making sure we are a part of the Solution and not the problem. We looked at how mowing, he, how mowing can impact turf health. Now let's look at how fertilizer impacts turf health. Turf health depends on applying the right amount of fertilizer at the appropriate time. 
Too much or too little fertilizer applied at inappropriate times can cause turf stress and pest and disease problems. And let's have a look at that in detail. Okay, so the turf researchers say that your fertilizer best management practices will include making sure that you apply the correct amount. If a little bit of fertilizer is good, more is not better, I promise you. <laughs> you wanna make sure that there's a 10 foot buffer zone around water bodies where you do not apply any fertilizer because if you don't adhere to this buffer zone, some of your fertilizer would end up in the water body. Then you'll have a raging case of algal blooms. Nobody likes those. Um, doing a soil test is good if you see that your turf is having issues. So you don't always necessarily need a soil test but if you see that your turf is having issues, you might want to test for your pH because remember that chart I showed you that talked about how turf grow in different pH ranges. It would be good to know if your poor turf, gro turf growth is due to a pH issue. And so, you know, you don't have to willy-nilly test your soil. If the turf is happy, then it's happy. But if you notice that it's not growing vigorously or there are some issues, I would recommend testing for your PA just to make sure. Um, you want to use fertilizers with low or no phosphorus in this part of Florida because um, phosphorus is one of the elements that's abundantly available in South Florida soils, but also Phosphorus is one of the elements that contribute to algal blooms. And so um, not putting out phosphorus on your lawn is helpful for um, making sure that phosphorus doesn't end up in water bodies. You wanna fertilize your grass when it is actively growing. So you don't wanna fertilize it when it's dormant because doing so, um, can either trigger it to come out of dormancy and then you have a cold snap and boom, your grass is all burnt up. Or two, fertilizing it when it's not actively growing means that the roots are dormant and the roots aren't picking up any of the fertilizer you just put out and you've just wasted all your money. Um, when you do fertilize, you wanna pair it with a little bit of irrigation. So you don't wanna irrigate a lot after you fertilize because you can leach out all your fertilizer, but you can't fertilize and not water it in. Otherwise, the roots won't be able to pick up the fertilizer because that's how roots access fertilizer and nutrients. It's the nutrients get dissolved in water and the roots pick it up. So when you fertilize, you do have to irrigate uh, a little bit, just kind of water in the fertilizer a little bit. For newly planted grass, you don't want to fertilize between 30 to 60 days after planting because the roots have not yet um, recovered from transplant shock. And you want to wait until the roots have recovered from transplant shock to fertilize. Otherwise, they won't be able to pick up the fertilizer. And then you want to keep your fertilizer off any kind of hard surface, any kind of imperial, imp impervious surface, driveway, sidewalk, patios, etc. I know it might sound like, well, that's stating the obvious. Um, sometimes we have to state the obvious because, you know, say you're fertilizing a landscape bed and some of it spills over into the driveway. You might think, okay, it's not a big deal. It will wash off during the rain, but you don't want it to wash off during the rain because then it will end up in our stormwater bodies and create algal blooms. And so either sweep it up, put it back in the bag or sweep it into the landscape bed where plants will be able to use a fertilizer. Okay. All right. So for newly planted sod and sprigs, this is what it looks like when you just put the sod down. 
um, you don't see roots growing out. Once you lay it down, you want to wait for 30 to 60 days for the roots to grow into the, the um, native soil. And then after that, you will fertilize. And that means the roots will be able to pick up the fertilizer once you apply it. Okay. So you want to wait until it has established before you fertilize. Okay, so um, just an overview of the types of nutrients you would be providing in a fertilizer. Um, I always like to say to people, fertilizer is not plant food. I'm sorry if you have shares in miracle Grow, but when people advertise that you know they're selling plant food in the garden center, they can't do that. Plants make their own food. What they're selling are nutrients, you know, so they're selling nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but they're not selling food. Um, that's like the difference between you eating a plate of spaghetti and meatballs or eating a plate of vitamins. One is food <laughs> and one is nutrients, okay? Plants make their own food. You can't buy plant food, okay? Um, some plants are obtained from the atmosphere. So when, um, elements such as carbon, hydrogen, oxygen are derived from the atmosphere. Plants take those elements from the atmosphere to make their food. And then they get other nutrients from the soil, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, and other nutrients, they get that from the soil. So I mentioned if fertilizer spills out onto the roadway or driveway, don't just leave it there for the rain to wash off. Here is why we say that, because um, the nutrients will end up in the water body. Okay, this is a list of, let me zoom in so you can see it better. Well, yes, this is a list of nutrients that plants use to make their own food through photosynthesis. As I mentioned, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen comes from the atmosphere and water. And then the others come from the soil. So sometimes they're naturally occurring in soil. And I'm gonna show you that um, close up in detail. Sometimes the elements occur naturally in soil and sometimes the elements are in the soil, but because of the pH, the plants can't get them. And then sometimes the soil is deficient of the nutrients because rainfall has washed out those particular nutrients. And so really fertilizer is just a, um, a way to replenish the nutrients that have been lost from the soil, okay? Um, this is what we refer to um, in horticulture as plant nutrient availability based on pH. So you'll see here that at pH 5, the availability of nitrogen drops, phosphorus drops, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium drops when you go down to pH 5. However, the, the availability of iron increases at pH 5. Um, to some degree, manganese is still available, boron, copper, also available at pH 5. Molybdenum is not, okay? Similarly here, you know, where the most wide range for availability for plants would be anywhere from 6 to say 7.5, okay? All right. So if you think you're having um, nutrient issues, you can do a soil test for pH, as I said. You can do a soil test for any of these nutrients, um, the, pre the presence of these nutrients and the quantities in your soil, okay? Um, producers, so people who grow sod or corn or beans or blueberries, if they're having nutrient issues, what they will do is they'll actually take a sample from the plant itself, send it in, and so the researchers can tell them, oh, your plant, not the soil, but your plant is deficient in 
copper or zinc or whatever. And that way the producers are able to tailor their fertilizer regime um, based on what the plant's missing. So as I mentioned, it's best to fertilize during the growing season. We have lots of photosynthesis and lots of root development. You'll, um, because you'll have lots of photosynthesis and lots of root development, you'll have lots of roots available to pick up the soil. Now, I know some people might say, well, you know, there's a fertilizer blackout period in, in certain areas. This is true. So what we recommend is, um, you know, once the blackout period ends, I believe it's after September 30th, use a slow release fertilizer so that the nutrients will still be available once the, the plants start growing in spring and summer, okay? So when you're applying fertilizer, depending on the grass species, like I said, Bahia doesn't need any much, if any, fertilizer. But look on the color of the grass and it will tell you. Um, you want to you wanna fertilize no more than four times a year. Um, so you can do um, an application in spring. Um, you can do an application in summer, which would be an iron fertilizer or no nitrogen fertilizer in summer based on blackout periods, wherever you are. And then in fall, you can do another application and winter as well. But make sure you're not fertilizing dormant grasses. So this is a blackout period I talked about where um, people are restricted from using nitrogen and phosphorus as a lawn fertilizer um, during the rainy season because studies were, have shown that there has been um, an incident of what we call non-point source pollution. The pollution couldn't be pointed to any one specific entity, but a lot of the water bodies have been getting increases in nutrients um, due to fertilizer runoff from landscapes. And so that's why the fertilizer um, blackout period was initiated, okay? So when you're fertilizing, you wanna make sure that you're calculating it properly. How many square feet are you fertilizing? You know, do um, your math from back when in middle school, you find the area, okay, the length times the width um, for each section of your yard. And then you'll calculate how much slow release nitrogen you need. The fertilizer ordinance for Sarasota County recommends 50% slow release. And so if your NPK ratio is 15, 0, 15, then if you have 8% slow release, it means that if 8% if of the fertilizer on the bag says it's slow release nitrogen, then it means you're working with a 53% um, slow release product, okay? And 50% 50, 50 slow release product is a recommended fertilizer grade if you want to make sure that your fertilizer you put down in your yard isn't going to end up in the water body, okay? So then you do your calculations. Most of the fertilizer applications on your bag are going to say, this is how much fertilizer to put out per 1,000 square feet. And so you basically do your calculations for the area you plan to put the fertilizer down, and then you'll figure out how many pounds per thousand square feet you will need. <clears throat> uh, this is what the turf researchers recommend is a method to apply. So if this is your lawn overhead look, look, you go, you know, say you're going left, then right, left, then right, left, then right. After you've done that, then you go up, then down, up, then down, up, then down until all the fertilizer has been applied. <clears throat> Again, just to remind you of why you don't want to wait for the rain to wash this away. 
And like I said, I know it seems like I'm stating the obvious, but sometimes it's not so obvious, you know. People see, well, it's just grass. It's naturally occurring. It's not litter. It's not garbage. You know, I can leave it there. And the next time it rains, it will wash away. But there's a reason you don't want to do that because this is chock full of nitrogen from source potassium. This leaving it there until it rains, whoops, leaving it there until it rains will spell trouble for um, alg algal blooms in whatever water bodies this ends up in. Okay, so time for question number two in the chat. Um, type the answer to this question. A quick release fertilizer has more advantages than slow release fertilizer. And so while you're typing, I'm gonna to look to see if there are any questions in the chat. Okay. So let me look at the chat. Okay, so pretty much in the chat, it's, it's just request for the hard copy. Yes, I'll send that to you once I have your email address. Okay, so the answer to this question is no. Quick release fertilizer does not have more advantages than slow release. Your quick release is like pouring sugar on your landscape. The minute the rain falls or the minute your irrigation system goes off, your quick release fertilizer is dissolved and it goes away, just dissolved. Like I said, it's like putting sugar on your grass. The minute the water goes, that's it, the sugar is all gone. So quick release fertilizer does not have more advantages than slow release. Okay. And I'm, I'm gonna warn you that um, slow release fertilizers are having most issues might be a little more expensive because they actually have to coat the nutrients in a coating, almost like how M&M is coated in candy and the chocolate, the chocolatey goodness is on the inside. Well, the nutrient goodness is on the inside of the coat in slow release fertilizers. But even though it might cost a little more at the beginning, you end up saving a lot of money in the end because when you put down your slow release fertilizer, it doesn't all get dissolved the minute your irrigation goes off. And speaking of irrigation, let's figure out how you can manage your irrigation so it is not part of the lawn care problem, but rather it's part of the lawn care solution. All right, so this is a classic example of a lawn that has a root rot fungus. And root rot fungi just love irrigation. Um, you know, if your lawn is being irrigated more than twice a week, you are setting yourself up for trouble. As a matter of fact, if your lawn is being irrigated more than once a week, you're setting yourself up for trouble because especially as we get into warm season, a lot of the warm season fungi are gonna start um, exploding in population with the more water um, a plant gets, okay? So healthy roots are supposed to be white. You will see that these are completely brown, almost um, black because the tissue is dead, okay? So that's how you know you have overwatering issues, you have increased disease prevalence, you have a root rot, you have stunted growth, your turf is weak, you could actually pull this green piece up and everything comes up in your hands. That, that's how you know your turf is weak. Overwatering also encourages weed growth because any weed seeds that are there, the more water you give it, the more the seeds will germinate and so you're gonna have a bunch of weeds coming up. And um, your any issues associated with overwatering tends to pop up during the dormant months versus the months where the plants are actively growing. Because remember, when plants are actively growing, they are able to use up a lot of the water you're giving them. But if you're watering during winter, like you're watering 
when the temperature is below 70 degrees. The turf is not actively, actively growing. So the water is just sitting there. The turf is not picking it up. The water is just sitting there. The roots are swimming in water. I know you can't see it, um, but the roots are just dormant, swimming in a lot of, of water. And um, fungi just love that kind of environment. So um, how often should you water? That's a good question. We always recommend that you do like a um, uh, irrigation calibration system because how often you should water depends on where you are in Florida. So places that the temperatures don't get, um, I wouldn't say very high because we are the sunshine state for a reason. <laughs> But, you know, say South Florida has higher temperatures for the most part than, say, North Florida does. And so grasses in North Florida would need to be watered less often than grasses in South Florida. You also want to look at soil type. If you have a clay soil, then you want to water less often than a sandy soil. If the grass is growing in the shade, you want to water less often. If it's rainy season, Definitely want to water less often. As a matter of fact, you could turn off your irrigation system in the rainy season. And whether you have pests or diseases um, will impact how often you water and whether your area is governed by water restrictions. Okay. So I mentioned the most ideal thing to do would be to calibrate your water. Um, I mean, calibrate your irrigation system. I'll, show you more about that in a bit. But for Sarasota County, the water restrictions um, are in place for 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, unless you're trying to establish new sod. All right, so signs your lawn needs water. If you don't have an automatic system like I do, you know, monitor your lawn. It will tell you when it needs a drink, when it's thirsty. So the leaf blades will fall in half. The entire lawn might look bluish gray. You might have footprints that stay on the lawn because the lawn doesn't recover very well. And your root zone, when you feel the root zone, um, it's dry. So it means that your soil moisture levels are low, okay? Um, this is a table I've shown you before. So no, you're not having deja vu, but I just wanted to highlight here um, the drought tolerance of various grasses. So that's important to you. Like I said, I don't have an in-ground irrigation system. So I wanted a, a lawn that's gonna be very well, very drought tolerant. So that's why I chose Bahia. But this is a comparison of how good um, the grasses are at drought to tolerance. So we talked about how much how um how your frequency of watering this is what i mean when i say calibrating your irrigation system do you even know how much water your plants are getting from your irrigation system if you don't you should because the researchers recommend that you want to apply half inch to three quarter inch of water how do you know that you're doing that well you can calibrate your system using Pet, um, pet food cans or tuna cans, place them all throughout the lawn where your sprinkler would hit. Turn on your sprinkler for 15 minutes. Me well, after the 15 minutes, you measure how much water was calculated in the can. And so you'll know in 15 minutes, my irrigation system applies half an inch of water or two inches of water. And if your system is applying two inches of water in 15 minutes, and you're running it for an hour, you're way overwatering your plants, okay? So more irrigation best management practices, it is best to do fewer irrigations, but for a longer period of time to encourage a deeper root system. You should not have your system applying more than three quarter inches of water at any given event. Um, and if your system is going up twice a week, you should think about cutting it back to once a week. Don't water in the evening. So after 
sunset, it's not a good idea to water after sunset because the water droplets will stay on the leaves and not evaporate. Chances are they will leave overnight and you can have fungal issues. Okay, so back to our beloved turf researchers. <laughs> they also showed that if you have um, your irrigation system going off less frequently, but for a longer period, it encourages than, than say short frequent in, um, irrigation, it encourages deeper root growth. So the arrow on the left, you have root growth like this, if you water every other day for 10 minutes versus watering once a week for half an hour, encourage it. It's the same 30 minutes of irrigation, but it's longer duration of irrigation, but less frequently. So once in one, watering once a week for 30 minutes will give you deep root growth versus three times a week for 10 minutes. All right, and as I said, you don't want to water after sunset um, in the evening, but you do want to water a little bit before sunrise or at sunrise. So whatever water is on the leaves will dry up over the course of the day, but you're not going to lose a lot of water due to drift and evaporation. And this is better for um, the health of your turf. Which can, which can experience diseases if the leaves are wet all night. You wanna make sure that your rain shut off device is functioning. It should be um, it sh where, wherever it is installed. And if you, have an in, if you have an automatic system, by law, it should be connected to one of these. So whoever installed it, just, you know, if the builder installed it or whoever you bought the property from installed it, just go find out where this is, it should not be covered by anything, it shouldn't be covered by a shrub or a bush or, or the eaves. It should have access to rain so that when the rain falls, there's a cork inside that gets wet. And when the cork is wet, it tells your system, it's, it rained yesterday or it rained today, don't turn on. This will help you um, avoid overwatering because imagine, if it rained this morning and then at 4 p.m. this afternoon your system goes off, your plants are being overwatered. And so that's why it's important to make sure that your rain shut off device is working, okay? You also want to check for um, broken heads to make sure that, you know, there is uniform coverage. This is important because if, if there's not uniform coverage and you're running the sprinkler for 30 minutes every day, but then you're gonna have some bald spots where the sprinkler isn't reaching and so it's gonna be all brown. And so you have to run the sprinkler longer for that area that's not working versus um, the area that's working. And then the, in the area where the sprinkler head is working will be overwatered because you're trying also to water the grass in the area where the sprinkler herd is broken. So you wanna just make sure you're fixing everything. Okay, so question three, I'm gonna to go to the chat box, but you type your answers in. Most lawn irrigation systems should be run twice weekly. Is that yes or no? And while you're typing in the chat, um, someone asks, is milorganite a slow release fertilizer? Yes, it is considered a slow release fertilizer um, because it is composted material and not um, what we call quick release or soluble fertilizer. Okay, so I'm seeing lots of no's and the answer is yes, the answer is no. <laughs> yes, the answer is no. Lawn systems should not be run twice weekly. Once a week maximum is good to maintain a healthy lawn. Because remember, the more frequently you water your lawn, the shorter the roots are. And if you have short lawn roots, you're just begging for trouble. It's what you're doing. Okay, all right. 
So we're going to do a quick wrap up of lawn pests and diseases, then get you um, out of here in time for lunch. Okay. So lawn pests and diseases. Um, not every brown spot on a lawn is because of a pest. It could be because of environmental stress. It could be as a result of overwatering, underwatering, over fertilizing, under fertilizing, mowing, pH issues, temperature issues. It could be sunburn. It could be because of shade. It could be because of traffic and wear and tear in the lawn. It could be dog urine spots. It could be that the lawn was subjected to standing water or recycled water or water high in salts. So not because the grass looks like it's sick means the problem can be solved by breaking out a sprayer, okay? Sometimes it's going to be as a result of an insect, a disease, a nematode, or a weed. So let's just have a look at that. So here are a comparison of turf pests. Just to note, in horticulture, when we say pests, we mean anything that is detrimental to the health of a plant. So a weed is considered a pest. Um, insects, nematodes, considered pests, okay? Um, common turf insects include your turf caterpillars. So there's some army worms that um, like to eat St. Augustine. Your scarab beetles, your chinch bugs, hunting bill bug, your mole crickets, your scales, and your mealybugs. You do have turf mealybug um, and some scale insects that will affect turf. For diseases, there's your gray leaf spot, your large patch, your take all root rot, your sugarcane mosaic virus. For your viruses, there's not much you can do if you come down with a patch of sugarcane mosaic virus in your turf, you're gonna have to remove the turf and put some, put um, a fresh batch of turf in or replace it with something else. Then you also have nematodes, which are microscopic worms that attack um, the roots of the turf. And then you have weeds that compete with turf for sunlight and nutrients, water as well. So your tropical sod webworm, this is what it looks like here at the top. Your fall army worm, um, look for the inverted Y. So it's like an upside down Y at the top of the head. That's how you know you have a fall army worm, okay? Um, and you wanna look for damage uh, at different times of the year, April to November for your tropical sod web worm and um, fall in for your fall army worm. This is what it looks like if you have either of these. This is what the damage looks like. The leaf blade will be all chewed up like this. You'll have webbing in the grass from your tropical sub webworm and your grass will look thin like that. Okay. Um, interesting thing to note here. This bug is what we call a beneficial bug. And the beneficial bug is actually eating the caterpillar, okay? What it does is some beneficial bug will actually lay eggs inside the caterpillar, what we call parasitize it, lay eggs inside the caterpillar, and then when the eggs hatch, they eat the caterpillar from the inside out. I know it sounds like a space, um, a science fiction movie, but it actually does happen. So when you are doing any kind of treatment, you want to make sure you're using chemicals that will not harm the natural enemies or the beneficial enemies because then you're shooting yourself in the foot. Because if you get rid of Mr. Good Guy here or Mrs. Good Guy, then you're gonna have more caterpillars to spray, you know? So you wanna make sure that whatever it is you're using will not affect the beneficials. Um, here where I have BT or conserve, BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, and it 
is specially targeted at caterpillars and it won't harm beneficial um, bugs like this or beetles, okay? So your two lined spittle bug, this is how you know you have your spittle bug, that's what it looks like up close and personal. This is how you know you have spittle bug when you see foam. <laughs> um, um, encasing your leaves. And then sometimes you'll have a stripe going down the leaf. You'll notice um, here, and that's how you know you have spittle bug. Then we have our beetles. Now, um, these beetles, uh, the larvae are what actually eat the grass um, roots. And so you'll find if your lawn, and like I said, I am very set it and forget it when it comes to my landscape. So I don't really treat for issues. I let the birds come in and eat all of these grubs, <laughs> you know. And so um, I know I have grubs if my lawn is full of birds eating grubs. Um, a lot of ibis like to eat these grubs. Um, but this is what the grubs look like. So this is what the beetle looks like. The adults, they lay eggs, the eggs hatch, um, larvae emerge, and the larvae will feed on your roots, which is why you don't want to water too often because you want your roots to be long and deep <laughs> in case you get an attack of grubs. And my lawn, I'm not you know, tooting my own horn or anything. I'm just saying, I'm a set it and forget it kind of horticulturist. So because I don't have an ingrown system and I water when the rain says, you, when, when the lack of rain says to water, I have a really deep root system. And so when there are grubs in my lawn, I don't really notice damage to the lawn because by the time the population gets to the point um, of, you know, chunky grubs like this, the birds are all over my lawn and they take care of it. So just showing you that it it is a cycle where, you know, if you don't water a lot and you don't fertilize a lot, you'll have deep roots that will be able to um, tolerate a little bit of pressure from grubs, okay? All right, here are your chinge bugs, which is everybody's favorite bug to hate. <laughs> Um, I don't have a St. Augustine lawn, so I don't really have a chinch bug issue. So, um, for some reason, chinch bugs just love St. Augustine grass. The insects are present year round, but when you fertilize a lot, water a lot, the populations explode, and then you'll see lots and lots and lots of brown patches, okay? Now, back to what I was saying, you know, you have Mr. Goodbug or Mrs. Goodbug. The Southern Chinch Bug is Mr. Bad Bug. The False Chinch Bug is harmless. Notice the, the difference between the wings. These wings are kind of um, translucent, transparent, and these are kind of opaque. Then you have Mr. or Mrs. Goodbug. This big-eyed bug feeds on chinch bugs. So again, you want to make sure you know what it is you're trying to control. Don't be trying to kill the big-eyed bug because then you're going to have more chinch bugs. All right, hunting beetle bug. Like I said, we don't have a lot in this area, but they are particularly um, voracious on your zoysia and your Bermuda grass. This is what they look like, the, the grown-ups. This is what the larvae look like, okay? Mole crickets. Now I have Bahia and so mole crickets are an issue for me. Um, most of the damage is gonna occur in summer and fall, um, but it's easy to find out. What, oops, 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 mouse is just like running away running away. <laughs> it's easy to find out if you have mole crickets. If you see a bald spot, just flood, just get a bucket of soapy water and flood the area with that bucket of soapy water 
and the soapy water will go down into the mole cricket tunnels and you'll see them running out. They'll just come running out of the tunnels. And so um, that's an easy way for you to control mole crickets, okay? But hay grass, Bermuda grass, centipede grass are the food of choice for mole crickets. This is just the different types of mole crickets that we have. Short winged, tawny mole cricket and your southern mole cricket. The turtle mealy bug I mentioned is, I wouldn't say new, but it's newer than say chinch bugs and other um, ones that we've seen. You, um, so your turtle mealy bug at the top, your Bermuda grass scale, um, your Rhodes grass mealy bug, and your ground pearls are some other pests that will suck on the plant juices of the um, the grass blades and a lot of times because they're so tiny you actually don't notice that they're there until there is a lot of widespread damage okay so again you want to be a part of the solution not the problem so you want to avoid overwatering because then your roots are going to be short you want to avoid using soluble fertilizers because you want the slow release fertilizers to slowly have the nutrients available to the plants when the plants need them. So the plants can grow healthy and um, you know they don't have nutrients when they're dormant and not needing nutrients. You wanna mow at the correct height. You wanna minimize thatch buildup because thatch buildup is increased when you increase fertilizer. You want to do scouting, which is what we, um, so scouting means you just walk, just stroll through your landscape and look, look at the grass. How does it look? Is it looking healthy or are there weird looking things on it? If there are weird looking things on it, it's time to act. You can't wait until half the lawn is brown and that's when you notice, oh my God, what's happening? Because when half the lawn is brown, it means that there are thousands and thousands of critters <laughs> that laid eggs and have started chewing on your lawn. So, you know, on the weekend, you don't have to um, necessarily make it a weekend project, but just stroll, stroll through the landscape and see if you notice anything weird. This soap flush is what I told you about. Get a bucket of soapy water, just throw it all over um, a, a spot in your lawn that you think might have issues. And then you'll see chinch bugs floating up, or you might see mole crickets floating up as well. You want to spot treat as needed with pesticides that won't harm beneficials. You also want to rotate your pesticide. MOA means mode of action. So um, if something is a stomach poison for an insect, you know, whatever the active ingredient is, then you don't want to keep using that same active ingredient over and over. You want to rotate it with another pesticide that may be a neurotoxin or it may be um, what we call a molting inhibitor or a growth inhibitor. So um, that's what you want to do. Make sure you look at the active ingredient of the pesticide and make sure that when you use it for a period, if you're going to buy another pesticide, it does not have the same active ingredient as the one you've been using all along because then you will develop resistance. This is very important. A lot of um, chinch bugs have become resistant to the chemicals that we have been using on them. And so this is very important for you to switch around the kind of chemicals you're using. Okay, so let's look at diseases. In the few minutes we have left, um, Fungal diseases are most common in plants in general and in turf. This is what your gray leaf spot looks like on your St. Augustine. Notice the leaf spots are gray. Corny joke there. Mm -hmm. um, then you have your large patch, also called Rhizoctonia. And you will know it's Rhizoctonia when you tug, just tug on the tip of the leaf blade. And if everything comes out in your fingers, you know you have rhizoctonia because it means that the base of the leaf blade or the sheath is rotting. And this 
particular fungus loves a lot of fertilizer, lots of nitrogen, <laughs> lots of soluble fertilizer, and it loves a lot of water. And you can spread it by um, mowing equipment, okay? All grasses are affected, but zoysia, remember high maintenance girlfriend, and um, St. Augustine are the grasses that tend to suffer the most from rhizoctonia. Then you have your take all root rot. Um, this one, you know you have that in that when you pull um, on the end of the, the leaf blade, it's not just the sheath that comes out. So the other one, the roots will stay in the ground, but the sheath comes out. This one, everything, the entire thing will come right up, roots and all. That's why they call it take all root rot because it takes everything, everything goes, okay? All Florida grasses are susceptible, but for some reason we see it a lot in St. Augustine. I don't know if because um, people who manage St. Augustine use more fertilizer than other grasses or water, but we know that excess nitrogen, quick release nitrogen and excess water will make the disease worse. You also have it occurring in association with nematodes. Your sugarcane mosaic virus, you know you have it when it looks like somebody took a blowtorch and torched your lawn and it's not the middle of winter. I have to say that because we have been getting calls, you know, like in say January and February that people's lawns look like this, but sometimes it's because they were running their irrigation system while the grass was dormant the grass started to grow and then you had a cold snap and all the new growth just got crunchy. Um, and then your lawn looks like you got blow, um, torched. So if the temperatures are not low or have not been low and it looks like somebody took a blow torch to your lawn, lawn chances are you have the sugar cane mosaic virus and we have no chemical treatments available for viruses. So you're gonna have to rip it up and put something else in, like a more resistant variety, like bitter blue or palmetto. All right, so weeds. Um, if you have a weedy lawn, chances are you've been giving your lawn a lot of water or a lot of soluble fertilizer. Um, there has been something that has been causing thin, thin or bare spots. Maybe it's too shady and the grass isn't growing vigorously. So a lot of light is going in through the soil and then the weeds that are in the, the weed seeds that are in the soil are just germinating in the bare spots. Or you're mowing too short and allowing a light into the areas where the weed seeds are. Or you've not been paying attention, close attention to when you have one weed. So when you have one weed pop up, you don't notice it. And then that one weed becomes a hundred weeds because the weed spread a hundred seeds. So you wanna make sure that whatever weed you're trying to control, you know what it is, okay? You have your broadleaf weeds, like your dollar weed. The, 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 you know it's a broadleaf weed, not because it has broad leaves, but because the veins coming off the central vein run in a network pattern. You have grassy weeds, which um, have the veins coming off the central vein are parallel. And then you have sedges. These sedges, when you roll it around in your, when you roll a stem around in your finger, it feels like the edges of a pencil. And so that's how you know you have a sedge. It's very important to know whether the weed you're treating is broadleaf, grass, or sedge, because that will tell you what kind of herbicide to buy, okay? You also need to know whether to use a pre-emergent herbicide. There are some grasses, especially if you have like crabgrass sitting in the middle of your St. Augustine lawn. The best thing for you to do is to use a pre-emergent because the pre-emergent will kill all the crabgrass seeds before they germinate because 
If you wait for the crabgrass seeds to germinate, it's going to be hard for you to find a crabgrass killer that won't also kill your St. Augustine. Okay. So pre-emergent herbicide means you put it down, you'd put it down on the grass, but it would kill the seeds of the weeds that have not yet germinated. And then your post-emergence, you will use it to kill any weed that has already emerged. And this here is a broadleaf weed being killed in the middle of a grass. So you wanna know, is it a broadleaf weed or is it a grass? That will tell you what kind of herbicide to buy, okay? So common weeds include your common Bermuda grass, your crabgrass species, we call these our tough customers because they're hard to get rid of. And your torpedo grass, which is everybody's favorite grass they hate. <laughs> and as I mentioned, grass weeds are very difficult to control in St. Augustine lawns because grass killers will often also kill your turf grass, okay? So this is what we recommend if you wanna keep your grass weed free don't over fertilize, don't over water, mow as high as you possibly can and choose um, a shade tolerant turf type if you have a shady yard because um, the other turf won't grow very well in a shady yard and then the weeds will just take over in the bare spot. And with that, just a shout out to all the researchers and experts that have um, contributed their knowledge to this information that we're presenting to you. We are going to um, wrap with two recommendations. So here, if you have not gotten one of these, um, this link gives you a PDF version to our Florida Friendly Landscaping Plant Guide. It will answer almost any question you have about choosing the right plants for your landscape. And um, I'm going to put our survey link. When, when I send you the copy of the PowerPoint, I'm going to send it with a survey link. Please let us know um, how we can improve on the presentation by filling out our survey. Your feedback is very valuable to us. And with that, thank you so much. I'm going to start my video so you know I'm still here. I'm not a robot, not a corny joke. Do you just love it when those websites say, are you a robot? <laughs> Yeah, so with that, my contact information is there if you need more information or you have questions. So glad you could join us and take care until next time. Bye-bye.